I'm Vinny Politan. Welcome to a special edition of Court TV Live. Uh, for those of you wondering, I will return to my regular show at its regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, beginning January 3rd, when courtrooms across America open once again after the holiday uh, break that many of them take. Now, in this hour, I want to take a look at some of the big trials that we'll be covering in 2022. Uh, trials that are on our docket, that are on our radar, that we've been following uh, and, and covering as we get ready for these uh, cases to happen. The first one I want to talk about tonight uh, comes to us uh, from the state of Florida down in Palm Beach County and was a cold case or seemed to be a cold case back to 1990. 1990, when Marlene Warren um, opened the door, uh, the doorbell rang, she opened the door, and there was a clown there with balloons and a gun, and the clown shot and killed Marlene Warren. Well, the case went unsolved for many, many years, but now it's on our docket. Ted Rollins has the story of the killer clown. It started out as a typical day for the Warren family living on this quiet street in Wellington, Florida, an equestrian community just north of Miami. That morning, I do remember we were eating breakfast. Um, nice, calm Saturday, I believe it was. Joe Ahrens was 21 years old at the time. He will remember that Saturday for the rest of his life. It was May 26, 1990. A clown carrying balloons and flowers came to the Ahrens door. Joe's mom, Marlene Ahrens Warren, reached for the flowers and was fatally shot twice in the face. It was... Uh one of the worst days of my life. Aaron's heard the gunfire and ran to find his mother in a pool of blood. He saw the clown walk away and disappear into a white car, but had no clue who the killer was, and neither did police. The case would go cold for decades. Then, finally, after 27 years of break, advanced DNA testing led authorities to Sheila Keen Warren. Testing has evolved over time, and there were apparently some pieces of evidence that they wanted to re-examine, and they sent it to an FBI lab. And it's unclear which part of that led to the arrest, but something stuck, and that's how they were able to make the arrest. Keen Warren was living in Virginia. She was arrested and charged with first-degree murder for the shooting death of Joe Aaron's mother, Marlene Warren. I could not grieve because there was no closure in the case. Authorities suspected Sheila was having an affair with Marlene's husband, Michael Warren. Michael and Sheila eventually married in 2002. She was living with him at the time of her arrest. The trail that led investigators to Sheila Keen Warren contained many twists. One of them, a deathbed confession from John Moran, a family friend. John Moran passed away, but before he died, he shared a secret with his son, John Moran Jr. My father told me everything that happened before he died. I knew where the car was, I knew who planned it, I knew where the gun was at. John Moran Sr. worked with Michael Warren, who was married to the victim. Warren was questioned by police but never charged in his wife's murder. He was a used car dealer who was later arrested on charges of grand theft, odometer, tampering, and racketeering. Warren's friend, John Moran, told his son before he died that Warren may have had something to do with his wife's death. On his deathbed, he told me that car would get me anything I ever wanted for Mike Warren. Moran Jr. told detectives that Michael Warren tried to bribe him. Investigators followed up on details Moran Jr. gave them, including information about what could have been the killer clown's getaway car. John Moran Jr. said his dad told him where some of the evidence was kept. Police went diving in a Palm Beach canal where Moran Jr. says he and his father helped dump the evidence. However, investigators did not find the clown costume or murder weapon. Without that evidence, police can't make a case for murder against Sheila Keen Warren, according to their lawyer. I do know enough about this case, not from the discovery process, but from my knowledge of the case, that she's innocent. So there's some additional evidence in this case. There's going to be some eyewitness testimony, we believe, from uh, two people who sold Sheila Keen Warren a clown costume and some balloons, balloons on the day of the murder. But that was 1990, May 26, 1990. 
How is that eyewitness testimony going to hold up? Will it be enough along with the mysterious DNA evidence? That evidence, we don't know exactly what it is connected to, but obviously it was enough for investigators and prosecutors to move forward in this case. Uh, let's talk about it. Let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Al Wunsch III in Los Angeles, deputy public defender Philip Dubé, and in the Bronx, New York, criminal defense attorney Renee Hill. Welcome to you all. Great to see you. Um, you know, you go back to 1990, Al, uh, Windows 3.0, Godfather 3, and Millie Vanilli uh, get exposed as lip syncers. I mean, that was yes. a long time ago, Al. What's it going to be like when these witnesses get up on the stand and say, oh, yeah, I remember selling those balloons to uh, Sheila Keen, now Sheila Keen Warren? Well, <clears throat> first of all, Vinny, if you've ever been to the circus, how many clowns fit in those clown cars? So keep that in mind. So I don't think any of that DNA evidence is going to be able to come in because I've seen at least... 30, 40 of them get out at the Ringling Brothers, Barter and Billy Circus in New York City. So you are looking at a very difficult situation for a prosecutor. I mean, in order to get the arrest, I mean, all they have to do is have probable cause to believe that a crime had been committed. They had enough to get her arrested. But let's try getting her convicted. And taking a look at something that goes back that far is going to be very difficult. And the clown costume and the balloons... Okay, you know, but like who doesn't have a clown costume, Ben? That's what I say. Yeah, I, I actually do have one. It's left over from Halloween. <laughs> uh, but Philip Dubé, I mean, you've got witnesses who are going to say that she bought a clown costume. You've got another witness who's going to say she bought balloons the day of the murder. How is that testimony uh, going to go over? How credible can it be if we're talking about going back you know, more than 30 years? It's a very good question, but you know, your memory about Millie Vanilli and all the other stuff from that era is just as fresh, Vinny. So people don't forget certain things, you know? I mean, let's face it, how often do you go out and buy a clown costume? It's a little weird, you know? And for a woman of, of this stature and this station in life, why would she go out? But I think the bigger problem is going to be to uh, for the defense is to, it's my understanding that uh, the defendant's DNA is on the balloons. And I believe on the flower stems or on the petals or somewhere like that. And if I recall correctly, I think the victim's hair with uh, the root is in her car. So, and it had a unique hair color on it. I believe she dyed her hair. I don't know if it was, you know, purple or, you know, eggplant or fuchsia, something like that. So it's an unusual hair color that's going to tie her directly to the victim. A absent a solid alibi and a motive to want to end this woman's life, or perhaps showing that somebody else did it. Perhaps she bought the costume and the balloons and gave them to a third party. She could be falsely implicated. But absent that, this lady's in trouble. Yeah, and, and motive, I, I, I think it's gonna be pretty obvious, Renee Hill, she's having an affair. She becomes the future, uh, you know, Mrs. Warren. She is accused of murdering Marlene and then marrying her husband. And it was a few years later. They didn't get married right away. But uh, prosecutors, I believe, will allege that they were having an affair prior to the murder. So the motive seems like it's pretty, pretty clear there. But the other problem is the original description of the clown was like six feet tall and a man. And she's not six feet tall and she's not a man. Right. And that's certainly something that the defense is going to take a look at and, and bring that out to the jury. And then the other thing that is going to be important um, is when the uh, witness who's going to testify about selling the flowers and the balloons to um, to her, when they gave that statement to the police, is that something that they just learned of more recently or did they have that information back when the crime occurred? So that's something very important, <clears throat> excuse me, that they're going to have to look at. Now, Al, uh, Philip rightly pointed out that I have a pretty good memory from days gone by. But uh, again, I, I, I cannot recall which one was Millie and which one was Vanilli. So um, it's clear, but not crystal clear at this point. Um, to me, the, the, the DNA that Philip talks about becomes very important. We know how much jurors love them. Uh, in a cold case, that seems to be 
the most important piece of evidence that you can bring forward because anything else can be attacked. Eyewitnesses, people who suddenly come forward after 30 years can be attacked. Uh, but these days, it's, it's kind of tough to attack DNA, isn't it? It is tough. But uh, first of all, Fab was Millie. So just so you know. Um, but the situation with regards to DNA evidence, you're right. They do like to see that kind of stuff. But, you know, there could be a logical excuse as to why there is something in that car. We haven't seen how conclusive the evidence is. We have assumptions with regards to the same, but everything hasn't been put out and laid out in front of us yet. The, the situation with DNA is always attractive to a jury. They love it. They like watching it on all those different crime shows. But the bottom line is going to be, if there's a plausible excuse for anything being there, it's going to be very difficult to prosecute, let alone convict this woman. Philip, do you expect to see Michael Warren anywhere near that courtroom? He is well, the, he's, a, he's the, you know, it was his wife who was murdered, but it's his wife who's on trial. Uh, do you expect to see him on a witness stand in the gallery behind the prosecutor behind his wife? What would you expect in this situation? Well, first and foremost, you can bet he's going to be under subpoena. They're going to do whatever they can to get him in there to establish the relationship with the new girl, with the clown who allegedly killed the ex-wife. Uh, that's for starters. But I could actually see him taking the fifth. Uh, you know, there's an argument to be made that he was in on this. What would be her motivation completely alone to just want to snuff this woman out? You know, it'd be one thing if, uh, you know, there was some financial incentive uh, or if there was a property incentive of some type. But just out of jealous rage, it's kind of hard to believe. It sounds like that there was something more in it for the ex-husband. And if I were him, I would take the fifth and ask for a lawyer and I wouldn't take the stand. Well, he has experience with criminal lawyers. So I think he knows the drill. So we'll see how that all turns out. Again, folks, let's take a look when this is happening. Uh, it is on the docket for 2022. We have a trial date. Let's take a look. May 28th, May 28th, 2022, Florida versus Sheila Keen Warren, the killer clown trial. When we come back, I want to talk about the next live trial on Court TV, scheduled for January 3rd. This one out of Wisconsin, there is a videotape and there's an allegation of self-defense. Does it sound familiar? Are there any um, similarities between this case and the Rittenhouse case? We'll break it down next. This is no longer the search for missing children. This is the search for killers. This stretch is just so beyond what anyone could imagine. Breaking news in the case against doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Lori, I should ever come up with this. Lori was his follower. Chad Daybell's the prophet. Chad had a vision, plagues, and foreign troops coming to the soil. Will his wife, Lori Daybell, turn on him? It's just so hard to know where. The truth ends. All eyes on this Idaho trial. Big ruling by the judge. The venue changed. The further away you can get from the scene of the alleged incident, the better off you are. Think about all the people that had to die and disappear. It's the doomsday prophet Chad Daybell on trial. Welcome back. We're taking a look at some of the big trials that are on the docket in 2022 here on your front row seat to justice and the doomsday prophet, perhaps the biggest of all. Uh, we'll be talking about that uh, later this week. Uh, in the meantime, let's talk about the first big trial of 2022. Uh, court TV camera scheduled to be inside the courtroom back in Wisconsin. Remember, we were there in November for Kyle Rittenhouse's trial. It was a case where the shooting was caught on video. It was a case where he alleged self-defense, and he was ultimately found not guilty. I mean, big, big trial. Well, now we've got another case with a video and an allegation of self-defense. Stephanie Haynes reported for our great affiliate WTMJ in Milwaukee. 
has the story of Wisconsin versus Theodore Edgecombe. This is a clear case of self-defense, and we look forward to and maintain confidence in our judicial system uh, to establish the same. Family, friends, activists, and attorneys spoke out, including Edgecombe's mother. My son is a very humble person, and anybody that knows him knows that this is not his character. According to the criminal complaint, in September of last year, Edgecombe was riding a bike when he came upon 54-year-old Jason Clearman and his wife in their car near Humboldt and Brady Streets. Prosecutors believe that's when there was some sort of verbal altercation and Edgecombe punched Clearman. Edgecombe's attorneys say this new surveillance video shows the Clearmans followed Edgecombe onto the Holton Street Bridge and shows Clearman got out of the car and approached Edgecombe in the moments before the shooting. Shortly after the shooting, TMJ4 News spoke to Clearman's wife. My husband got up because he just talked to the man and the guy waited for him just standing, just standing there waiting. So my husband got real close. I saw him pull out a gun, and my husband never saw it because he was close and shot him point blank in the head. And I saw my husband drop to the gun. Edgecombe's attorneys are trying to retain the same self-defense expert the attorneys for Kyle Rittenhouse used at trial. Theodore Edgecombe deserves the same right that Kyle Rittenhouse got. Okay, so how similar or different are these two cases? Well, the, the defense is the same. The defense is self-defense, justifiable homicide, okay? Now, the, the part of the video that you see, you also heard the, the, the story. Now, the video shows what happens right to the point where um, the shooting takes place. But just before the video picks up what happens, prosecutors are going to allege, and I believe it will be, uh, the victim's wife, who was driving the car, who will testify about what happened, which was um, they're going to allege that the, uh, the defendant was riding his bike uh, recklessly or, or carelessly. There was a verbal altercation. And then the man on the bike, uh, Theodore Edgecombe, the defendant, who shot and, and killed Jason Clearman in the head, um, punched Clearman when Clearman was still in the car, in the passenger seat. And then they both ended up going in the same direction, and that's when uh, Jason Clearman gets out of the car and you saw what happened on the video. That's where he approaches him, ends up getting shot. Let's bring back in our think tank, still with us, uh, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Al Wunsch, the third deputy public defender for Los Angeles County, Philip Dubay, and criminal defense attorney Renee Hill. All right, Philip Dubay, um, do you see similarities here? Is there a huge difference? Is, what, what do you see in comparing what we know about this case and what we saw I transpire in the same state with Kyle Rittenhouse. Oh, no. I think his supporters are tone deaf, Vinny. I don't even think it's even close. Here you have the initial aggressor sucker punching somebody who's just driving by in his car. Okay. And now he gets out unarmed. Okay. Going toward the initial aggressor. Initial aggressor now pulls out a gun and uses lethal force. No. No jurisdiction will support a claim of self-defense on those facts. No. Now, if he would have punched him back, he would have shoved him again. All right, that's maybe fair game. But this victim had absolutely no gun, no weapon, no knife, not even mace, pepper spray, brass knuckles, nothing. And he pulls out a firearm and he blows him away. I think he's going down harder than Humpty Dumpty. Renee Hill, do you see any similarities uh, between the two cases? Um, I really don't see a lot of similarities here. You know, in this instance, um, Edgecombe's weapon was concealed. In, in the Rittenhouse case, everyone could see what he was carrying. There's not as much chaos going on here. You know, this is really a one-on-one -on -one altercation, no other people around. So, you know, the, the question really becomes, to me, was the portion of him allegedly punching the passenger of the car, was that on video? Because if that's not on video, then it's gonna come down to the word of the wife saying this is what happened here. He's going to say, or his defense is going to argue that that car tried to swerve, tried to um, you know, go into him, get him off the road in some kind of way, and now 
they get out of the car and the person approaches him and he's in reasonable fear for his life. That's what I think the defense is going to argue here. So I think the credibility of the wife is going to be key for the prosecution here. So you're going to see them go, a, they're going to go after the wife. They're going to go after the wife. <clears throat> the defense is completely going to go after the wife to discredit her. Absolutely. Al, uh, your thoughts about this case versus the, the trial that we covered here on Court TV of Kyle Rittenhouse? Uh, it's not even close. I mean, in the case with Kyle, you saw him get in the hit, hit in the head with a, um, a skateboard. You saw the other guy pull a gun out, try to reach for his gun. And then the controversial one where the guy may have been reaching or may have tripped and going for the gun. In this case, the gun was out and everyone saw it. And still they took a chance going after him. This gentleman had a gun concealed, pulled the gun out and it very easily could have gotten away. I mean, if you watch this video here, he's on the bike, he's ahead of them. There is a cement divider between the, the sidewalk and the road that he could have very easily just continued riding. And there was no way that they were going to be able to get him at that point. He also rides off into an area where he could have made an escape. There was no issue here with him in any type of danger. He could have fled the scene very easily. And the fact that there's no weapon on, on the victim, the, a guy who is an attorney, and uh, don't hold that against him, but nonetheless, you have a situation where the guy had no weapon on him. What's the worst he was gonna do, yell at him? I mean, I think it was kind of stupid for the victim to get out of the car and, and to chase after the guy. I don't think that that was a very smart move, but it didn't deserve to cost his life. Philip, how about, uh, there's some other facts here um, in, in comparing the two. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, after firing his weapon, we see him attempt to surrender himself to police immediately. They wave him off, and then he turns himself in uh, back in back in his hometown. Um, this guy they were looking for for six months. Is the jury going to hear yeah. about that? And what does the jury think about that? That's called consciousness of guilt. That's exactly what it is. Somebody who is truly in fear for their own life and claims self-defense would go to the police or wait for the police and say, this guy tried to kill me. I had no choice but to take his life. Had I not have taken his life, I would be dead and you'd be interviewing him. But no, what does he do? He takes off. So that is classic consciousness of guilt. And somehow through the defense, they're gonna have to explain why he ran. Renee, as we watch the video, we can see that uh, Jason Clearman approaches him and jogs towards him. The car is, is uh, seemingly following the, the man on the bike, the defendant. Um, so there, I guess there's an argument uh, from the defense that he is being pursued at that point. Mm -hmm. Does he have to get up on the witness stand and testify, number one, about the initial um, confrontation that happened prior to the shooting that is not shown on the video? And does he have to clarify what happened in the final confrontation that we see on video, but is too blurry for us to actually uh, understand what is happening? Yeah, most times in self-defense cases, the defendant will have to take the stand. It's not very often that the facts and evidence that go before the jury are enough to support a self-defense claim without the defendant testifying. Occasionally that happens, but not very often. So in this case, I believe that it will be necessary for him to testify because he's going to have to be able to explain to the jury what was in his mind at the time of this altercation. He's really the only one that can put forth how he felt and what he reasonably believed or what he believed was going to occur. And then the jury would have to determine whether or not it's reasonable and the prosecution would have to disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt, if they're able to put forth that much before the jury. We don't know. All right, folks, like I said, this is the first trial of 2022. Take a look, we have a trial date. Court TV cameras inside the courtroom, January 3rd, Wisconsin versus Theodore Edgecombe, uh, right here on your front row seat to justice. When we come back, we're gonna take a look at another case that's on the docket for 2022. We've been following it for a couple of years now tracking uh, the progress of this. It all started as a missing child, and now that missing child's mother, teenaged mother, there she is, Megan Boswell, will stand trial for the murder
a baby Evelyn. Can a mother wait 30 days before ever reporting her child missing? The Casey Anthony trial grabbed the attention of the country because it was so unpredictable. Nine one one, what's your emergency? I have a three-year-old that's been missing for a month. She said, "Oh my God, I'm such a good liar." Everything that's coming out of your mouth is a lie. What happened to Kaylee? I don't know. The whole United States is looking for our Kaylee. You have more questions than you have answers. Because they said that the person that you dropped Kaylee with doesn't even exist. Surprise, surprise. Those were Casey's choices. The life that she wanted. She was partying and having a good time. Or the life that she had. There's something wrong. I found my daughter's car and it smells like this and it's that body. Everyone in this country gets a fair trial. How did Kaylee die? Even the most hated woman in America. Mr. Anthony, would you like to answer my question now? <laughs> what did you tell me? Casey Anthony is guilty of murder in the first degree. I really wish that none of this would have ever happened. Available now on demand at CourtTV.com. Welcome back. I want to go through a little fact pattern with you. Young mom, no dad in the picture, um, has a child that goes missing, but doesn't say anything, doesn't report the child missing. That young mom also uh, comes from a somewhat dysfunctional family, to say the least. And that young mom then lies to police and lies publicly about where the child is. Well, eventually the child is found, and the child is found dead, discarded, and the mom is charged with murder, right? Now, that fact pattern sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? There was a case we just showed you down in Florida had a fact pattern like that. Well, in 2022, we've got another case with a fact pattern like that. It's in Tennessee. It is the story of baby Evelyn. Evelyn. Hi. Hmm. 15-month-old baby Evelyn Boswell, a beautiful blue-eyed toddler from Tennessee, being raised by her teen mom, Megan, goes missing with an Amber Alert issued on February 19th, 2020. We remain committed and continue to do everything possible to find out what happened to Evelyn. Uh, and as always, as soon as relevant information and accurate information, I wanna, I wanna really reiterate that. As it comes to us, uh, we will get that out as soon as possible, okay? Uh, anyone with relevant information concerning Evelyn's whereabouts are asked to call 1-800-TBI-FIND. But that Amber Alert was not issued on the day she went missing. Baby Evelyn actually disappeared in late 2019. And her mom said she didn't report her missing because she knew the person who had her and did not want them to take off with her. I've told TBI where to find her in Mendota. My mom took her to a campground and a silver camper. And if they don't go tonight, I'm going to go find her myself. Just bring her back. I just want her back. That's all I want. I've been so long without her, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, why didn't you put it missing earlier? Because my mom threatened me, and I just want her back. That's all I can think about is how much I just want her back. But investigators were not buying Megan Boswell's stories. We're aware that we've received a number of conflicting, inaccurate statements from the mother, Megan Boswell, Evelyn's mother. What happens next is a strange string of events. First, Evelyn's grandmother, Angela, is arrested with her boyfriend in North Carolina for possession of a stolen vehicle, which was part of the Amber Alert. Then Evelyn's mom is arrested in Tennessee for making false statements. We determined that some of the statements Megan Boswell provided to us were false. 
Many of the false statements that Megan made delayed our investigations and uh, also got in, impeded our investigations on trying to find Evelyn. As a result, she has been charged with false reporting. Any questions about that? Any questions about that? Then big breaking news. Two weeks after Evelyn was reported missing, a toddler's remains are found. This evening, we received information that led TBI agents and Sullivan County detectives to a property belonging to a family member of Evelyn's mother in the 500 block of Muddy Creek Road in Blumpel. During the search, investigators discovered human remains believed to be those of a 15th month old girl. The remains will be sent for an autopsy and a positive identification. So now the question is, what happened to baby Evelyn and who is responsible? Well, investigators and prosecutors believe it is Evelyn's mom, Megan Boswell. She is going to be facing murder charges this year. Let's bring back in our think tank still with us, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Al Wunsch III. He's in Jersey. Uh, Deputy public defender for the Los Angeles uh, County is Philip Dubay and criminal defense attorney Renee Hill uh, up in the Bronx area of New York. Okay. Uh, Renee, let me start with you. Um, we saw what happened years ago. You know, I have to relive it on this show way too often, but um, there's a lot of similarities between these two cases. Uh, but in that case, in, in the, the death of Kaylee Marie Anthony, um, the defense pointed the finger at the family and put the family on trial and specifically pointed the finger at George Anthony as being the one who, who you know, disposed of the body and screamed at... at at his daughter and, and is the one that, you know, kind of made her lie and then sexually molested her when she was a child, even though they presented no evidence of it. Uh, all this stuff was, was, was put in front of this jury. Is that what's going to happen in Tennessee? You know, Vinny, it, it, it very well may happen. And I remember in the Casey Anthony case, when oh, the she jury said it. came she back, said it. I tried I'm to do so the segment sorry I said it. it. I know you don't like the name being said, but in that case, Vinny, you will recall when the, when the jury came back and read the verdict, those jurors, some of them were crying. They were visibly crying. And I always commended that jury for really, really abiding by the court's instruction because it looked like it pained them to find her not guilty, but they believed that they were upholding the law and they were following the court's instruction and they determined that the prosecution had not proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt and they acquitted in their case. Now here, in this case with baby Evelyn, the defense is going to be able to point the finger at this dysfunctional family, to point the fingers at the mother. Um, I, I think that's what they're going to have to do. And just based on the statements, some of them being false statements, right, that we know this teen made, but there are other things that were going on and probably other evidence that we are not aware of yet that will give the opportunity to the defense to point the finger at other people to say why she is not guilty of the death of her own child. Al, what, what shocked me down in Orange County is that the, the dysfunction that was in that household was really caused by the defendant in that case, okay? Uh, it wasn't caused by George and Cindy. It wasn't caused by Kaylee Marie. And the, the chaos in that house was caused by one person, one person only. Uh, in this case, though, I mean, there is, there is a history with law enforcement that uh, it seems almost every member of that family has. Uh, there are clearly some issues. She was, she's an even younger uh, mother um, than, than Kaylee Marie's mother was. So what are your thoughts? Here? Does, do, do they end up putting the family on trial just to try to create some gray area and some doubt here? Well, I, I don't think there's any other <clears throat> way that they can handle it other than to do that. You, <clears throat> you certainly have a very unique uh, family situation, a, a tragic situation with all of these forces coming together and then you have this little baby dead. So you have to do a kind of a scattershot approach in order to be able to deflect some of the blame on this baby-faced uh, mother, okay, who looks not that much older than the child that was killed, and make it seem like it is just a product of the environment that, that she was part of, that this was bound to happen. 
And in this case, you know, they took the death penalty off the table. So <clears throat> I think that is a disadvantage for her. I think it's leaving the death penalty on the table would have been better uh, from the defense standpoint, because I think a jury would be very hard pressed to give a 18 year old that looks like she's about a 15 year old or a 14 year old, the death penalty. So I think that uh, it was a smart move on the state. I know the state, the law required them to do it based on a case that had occurred a couple of years ago. But you, if you're the defendant in this case, and you're the defense counsel, you have to start doing a scattershot in order to be able to deflect from this girl and, and her stories and her lies. But you know, she's a product of her environment. Philip, what does this trial end up being about? Is it, is it about little baby Evelyn? Do you think that will actually happen inside the courtroom? Sometimes it's tough. The, the victim gets lost in all this. Will it be about Megan Boswell or will it be about her family? Oh, I think it's going to be a mix. It's going to be a, a biography, if you will, about all the dysfunction in that home. Uh, it's going to be a, a tearing at the uh, the heartstrings of everybody about the uh, the young, tender life of the baby. But I think most important, where I would focus my energy and marshal a defense, is what they have specifically on this young mother. It sounds like at most what I'm hearing is they have her as an accessory after the fact, and that maybe she's covering for mom. I mean, let's face it, they found the baby uh, in mom's yard. They found her buried there on the premises. It's not as if they found her within the belongings or the uh, the premises of the young girl. So it sounds like there, she's the patsy, if you will. She's sort of the fall guy in all of this. And I would want to see the actual physical, the biological, and certainly the circumstantial evidence. And I would want to uh, listen uh, and read any statements that she may have given to the police. All right, folks, this one happening in 2022. Let's take a look at the calendar. It is on the docket. We've got a bond motion hearing on January 21st, trying to get out on bond. We'll see if that happens. I doubt it. Uh, then a trial date of September 26th, 2022. When we come back, we've got one more trial to go over tonight. Uh, it's out of Florida, and it's a case that you saw once on Court TV. It was a hung jury. There's going to be a retrial. But my real question is, why isn't someone else being tried for this murder? That story next. When Florida State law professor Dan Markell was murdered in 2014, he was in the middle of a nasty custody battle with his wife, Wendy Adelson, who is the daughter of a prominent and very wealthy South Florida family. Markell was shot in his driveway. His wife, who was an obvious potential suspect, had an alibi. Eventually, investigators arrested and tried this couple, Catherine McManawa and Sigfredo Garcia, Prosecutors believe Garcia killed Markel for the Adelson family and that McVanawa set it all up. She wasn't involved. She doesn't have the answers that people want her to have. At trial, Catherine McVanawa denied knowing anything about the murder. Did you have anything to do with the murder of Don Markel? No, ma'am. But prosecutors believe that McVanawa is the connection between Garcia, the trigger man, and the Adelson family because she was previously in a relationship with Wendy Adelson's brother, Charlie, who had even once joked about hiring a hitman to kill Dan Markell. Do you ever joke about he looked into hiring a hitman, but buying you a TV as a divorce present would be cheaper? He did make that joke. The jury found Garcia guilty of murder, but couldn't come to a unanimous decision on Catherine McBanawa. If McBanawa wasn't involved, Charlie Adelson would have had to have hired Garcia on his own, which prosecutors say is unlikely because they didn't know each other. I am 100% convinced that Charlie Adelson somehow contacted Sigfredo Garcia without letting Catherine know. Part of that deal was Charles Adelson breaking up with Catherine so that Sigfredo could get back the woman that he loved so much. None of the Adelsons, who prosecutors clearly believe were involved, have yet been charged in Dan Markell's murder. Catherine McVanawa, meanwhile, remains in jail, waiting her retrial. 
So prosecutors are alleging a murder for hire here, but they're not charging the people who they say hired the murderers. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. They tried and they tried and they tried to cut a deal with Catherine McBanawa, but she refused to take any sort of a deal and testified in her own defense at her trial. Some jurors believed her. I think more jurors believed her than didn't believe her at the trial. Uh, but that uh, jury was hung. It's going to be retried. Uh, but what's going on here? Let's bring back in the think tank. Uh, this, this story always gets me um, you know, partially confused. The other part of me is just angry. Um, Philip Dubé, where, where in the world uh, do prosecutors charge a, a murder for hire and don't charge the ones that they say hired the murderers? Because to me, that is the person or people who are most culpable in the entire uh, case. Yeah, usually the solicitation for murder, however, Vinny, carries less time, right? I mean, normally the uh, the crime is caught in its tracks. But in theory, if they have enough evidence to go after the solicitor, they can file it then as a conspiracy to commit murder. It sounds like they just don't have enough evidence to be able to prove it. So it sounds like, though, that they did have some statements. They may have had text messages, uh, you know, uh, maybe some pieces of paper that tied communications between her and her then boyfriend uh, to having orchestrated the whole thing. But I still think it's too diluted. There is absolutely no incentive short of showing that she received some type of consideration for wanting to take out that law professor. I just don't think there's enough evidence. Al Wunsch, at the trial that I watched, there was, there, there was evidence that prosecutors put in tying uh, McBanawa to Charlie Adelson and payments from the Adelsons for, like, it was like one of those uh, uh, New Jersey uh, no-show jobs, Al, right? She didn't, mm -hmm. didn't she yep. do anything for the, for the dental office. She was a shot girl. She was literally a shot girl at a nightclub, and she's on the payroll at the dental office. They use that as, as the evidence, but... They haven't charged any of the Adelsons for all of this. And I, at this point, you can't cut a deal with McBanawa. She's already uh, under oath given testimony that she, she was no part of any conspiracy here. That's exactly right. And that's what they screwed up on with this case. And the fact that they're not going after this, the Adelsons, it makes no sense to me whatsoever. Certainly in New Jersey, there would have been charges pressed against them immediately with regards to this situation, because the nexus is just not there without <clears throat> his, her prior relationship with the brother. And it, it's the straw that stirs the drink in this case. Why they're not looking at it, why they're not going forward is certainly baffling to me. I mean, it, everything is there. I mean, this is like a Sopranos episode that is just gone awry because you're saying, well, we're, we're gonna prosecute the shot girl. We're not going to prosecute the guy who ordered the shots. Doesn't work for me. Renee Hill, I look at this and, and, and all the people that prosecutors have gone after don't have the money, power or influence that the Adelsons have. And, you know, as a prosecutor, th that's not part of the equation. It shouldn't be. You, I mean, I don't, I don't I wonder if they're scared of, of some Super, do I mean, they've got good lawyers, but um, my goodness, if you're alleging a murder for hire, let's charge the people who hired the murderers. Right. It, it makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, we're all saying the same thing here. Al, Al said it. This, this is ridiculous. Why wouldn't you go after the people that instigated and started the entire situation here? You're going to go after this young girl and, you know, dump everything on her and make her the fall guy for this? and not go after them, that doesn't make any sense at all. And I think it's a problem for the prosecution in this case. And I think that this new trial ends in another hung jury or an acquittal, as it should. Well, we shall see. I know prosecutors always have the advantage in the retrial, always do. But we'll see, we'll see what happens. <laughs> it's on our docket for February 3rd of 2022. We've got a pretrial hearing, then a trial date on February 14th. All right, folks, uh, big thanks to Al Wunsch, Philip Dubé, and Renee Hill. Thank you for all your help in 2021, and we're going to call on you for a lot more help in 2022. Thanks again. Have a great new year.